<laughs> there was a homework, so I actually got out of my habit of not giving you solutions, and I wrote solutions for this homework. Um, of course, the previous homeworks were just a piece of cake, right, compared to this. Uh, So, um, okay, and um, so I, 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 I drew my, my uh, even my graphs by hand, so I just kind of looked on the screen and uh, did it. But I'm going to talk about this a little bit. Um, and as I said, I spent just very few um, minutes on kind of wrapping up this Pontragian principle. Um, and go through sort of a few more examples. And then uh, at the break, I'll, I'll give you the FCQs. And after the break, um, I'll give you the final, and we'll just talk about it. OK? So I won't do as good of a job as uh, I was planning on justifying this, this maximum principle. Um, but I don't think there are going to be lots of complaints um, as far as you know, why do you, you know, what's behind that uh, Hamiltonian, what's behind that <coughs> minimization process? Um, I'll just kind of hint to the um, um, kind of reason why it's, it's there, but not, not go into many details. Um, so let's see. Um, there are some tools you may actually uh, be able to use in um, uh, this optimization problems. Um, and I posted a few. I mean, they're, they're not specifically for optimization, but um, there is There's a code in MATLAB that was kind of, it's already kind of old, but it's still working pretty well, that uh, uh, can draw face portraits. So what is a face portrait? Uh, if you have a system, let me just go here, opening it up. These are codes that are sort of um, written, and there are, I don't know, a thousand lines of code, so we don't really want to see that. But um, what's nice is like a user uh, interface. Let me see this here. So at a command line, you can actually type this command. It's called pplane7. And what it does, it's, um, I don't know if you can see very well, um, it's basically taking two equations, differential equations, and it plots solutions, okay, numerically. So, um, I was going to do this on the... Uh, Second problem. Let me let me start with problem number four. Okay, so on problem number four, we have basically the equation for x. It's second order, right? So we're going to convert it to a first order system. X one prime is x two. X two prime is minus x one minus x two plus u. Okay. And u is going to be treated as a parameter, which will, we'll, you know, we can control, right? So that's the control. And um, 
let's change this from negative 3 to 3, negative 3 to 3. And let's just kind of try to understand, let's give the value 0. That is, it's, un it's basically um, the system before it's controlled. So if you, if you use 0, you can actually proceed by having this, what's called a direction field. Um, what it is, is basically at each point, that's x1 versus x2, at each point x1, x2, the error, it's scaled, but it's the direction of the error is the direction of the right-hand side. It's basically the rate of change. So when you, when you want to solve at a point, what you do is you say, I mean, you solve it by clicking the point. I mean, that's nice. Um, And there are lots of things in the in the menus where you can say just go forward or go back backward in time. Uh, but what do you notice here? So the nice thing about this is you can click several points and get what's called a face portrait. Okay, so that's the that's the that system with u equals zero. Yeah, and. Uh, who can explain this? Why do we get this behavior? And the errors say you're going actually inward, right? Spiraling in the origin. So, why this? Or, or how do you explain this behavior? And why, why not a different behavior? For instance, if I now change the equations to just a pendulum, uh, well, okay. X one prime is x two. X two prime is minus x one. That's not. It's not the pendulum. It's well. It is the pendulum too. But um, and again, no control. Then what do we get? We don't get spiraling in. We get circles, right? These are really circles. So who who is kind of telling us? What do you expect? The oh, here's my pen. X one prime is X two, X two prime is minus X one minus X two. Or if x is x1, then we have x double prime plus x prime plus x equals. This basically the solution of this uh, second order constant coefficient homogeneous, right, um, is obtained by. You know, f solving this uh, equation, and that's uh, minus one half plus or minus i squared of three over two. So that's complex complex roots. So x of t is c one e to the minus a half t cosine squared of three over two t plus c two e to the minus one half t sine. Okay, and this is x one. And what is x2? The derivative of this, right? And when you plot kind of the tandem, the, I mean the x1 ver and x2 versus time, you can see what? You can see this factor, e to the minus 1 half, is always going to appear, right? That's basically going to shrink, going to um, make it smaller and smaller towards 0. And cosine and sine is going to do rotations, right? So that's that's why you see the spiraling in. Now, there's also the question: Is does it spiral in clockwise or counterclockwise? And that has to do with this. This being positive means it's going counterclockwise. Um, actually, the picture seemed to look the other way around. Huh? Anyway, I don't remember right now exactly what. Uh, yeah, it goes clockwise. Um, you can 
set it so it only gives you a forward. So you yeah, it's right. So you can <laughs> you you have lots of things. It's actually a good uh, good menu here, and options. You can say solution direction only forward, and you can erase all solutions and you just say, well, here's if you start at this point, that's what it's going to do. Okay, and so forth. Of course, to get a complete the complete face border is nice to have both back and forth because you, you, I mean, to basically fill the whole the whole plane. Um, okay, so this is the case when u is zero, right? Now, if you have a different u equals one, I mean, literally all, all you're changing is. In the equation for x1, for the position, you're putting a non-homogeneity there. And how do you solve this? Particular solution plus a particular solution to the non-homogeneous equation plus the general solution of the homogeneous. And we've seen what the homogeneous equation looks like, right? So it's C1, I'm not going to repeat, right? Plus C2, e to the minus 1 half sine. And, and a particular solution. And that's, you sometimes it's uh, tricky to find a particular solution. When this is a constant, though, what is the nice thing about this. You can pick that particular solution to be that constant because x, if I set x equals 1, x prime and x double prime are 0. And that satisfies. Okay, But if this is not constant, then, you know, there are all kinds of methods in, in DFQ class which says how to look for particular solutions. Okay. So what do you see in effect when you when you kind of apply a constant in this case? X gets one plus this, that's x one, but x two is so x one is this. But x two is x one prime is the same as before, right? So Really, it's just a shift of this picture. So u equals 1. It's a shift on the x1 axis. So you're actually going spiraling in towards this point, 1, 0. Right? Similarly, if u is negative 1, and again, we have to remember why we're only considering this. That's just a, a typical solution. It goes to negative 1, right? But this really should fill the whole plane. And that should fill the, the whole plane. Um, and why do we choose just 1 or ne and negative 1? Because that's what the contracting princi principle says, right? tells us we have to minimize a Hamiltonian and a Hamiltonian happens to be linear. Okay. So that's uh, this sort of the picture on this on this <coughs> in my solutions. Now that the thing is the following um, and that's again something that um, quite interesting and, and it probably you haven't seen before. I mean, you haven't done this kind of mathematics, uh, just looking at the picture, solving the problems by picture. Um, but what you have to remember now is that um, we seek optimal u, which takes values plus or minus 1, right? such that the system 
such that x star is driven from the initial point, which you know I said just pick it to be one, two. That's the initial point to the origin. Okay? Those are the initial conditions. Now, how you pick, I mean, in principle, that um, choice of you being one at certain time and being negative one at, at, at some other time is also given by the sign of the coefficient of u in the Hamiltonian. So I didn't, I mean, you have the Hamiltonian here, so it is given by the, cof by the sign of p2, okay, where p2 is that co-state variable. When you write the system for P2, though, you don't have initial or terminal conditions, right? Because you have four conditions for X. So you can have anything for P. Okay? So, so you don't gain too much information about the change in sign of P2 from that particular system. I mean, of course, it, it, it is a matter of being this specific system and not any other system. I mean, this particular system for P, if you look at it, it looks pretty similar to the system in X. So, do you have some extras in the back? Um, okay. So, if you solve the system in P, you're actually going to get spiraling in again, or spiraling out. But the fact that it's spiral says that the sign in P2 actually changes. And you don't know how often. Okay? Exactly. So you cannot really um, draw too much information from solving the system in P for this particular system. Okay? All right? So the only sort of uh, choice for us is to look at this face portrait. So these are the two possibilities, right? If you switch U to B1 for some time, then you follow this kind of trajectories, right? And if you stay with u equals 1 forever, you're always going to get to 1 and 0, right? So you're not going to get to what you want, to be 0, 0, right? Same. If you start with u equals negative 1 and stay u equals negative 1 forever, you're going to follow that, those trajectories. You're going to get to negative 1, 0, and you're going to be lucky if you actually are on the exact path which takes you to the origin. So there is a path here which, again, you would have to use a com computer to actually do it very uh, correctly. That would take it to the origin, but you have to be somewhere on this path. Right? Same here. You have to be somewhere on this path here. which, of course, would then continue towards, OK? So these are the kind of, if you happen to reach that path, then you're going to be driven to the origin. OK? So what do you, what's the only thing you can do? Well, you can go and sort of say, uh, let's put the, um, value equals 1 and start at 1 and 2. Okay, now there's actually a way to, you can input those values so you don't have to kind of, your hand doesn't, but I'm not going to do that now. Okay, so this is, if you started at 1, 2 with u equals 1, that's what you do. You're never going to be able to catch the u equals negative 1 branch. Okay. So that basically says uh, this strategy is not optimal. Okay. Of course, you can also see what if I go backward now, and this is a little bit, uh, but if you go backward from zero zero, then this is the trajectory that you should go, you should reach to get to the origin. 
Um, and then you do the same thing for sort of p equals for u equals negative one, right? And you see how you can actually make a combination of the two. Um, hmm? um, I haven't figured out a way to preserve this picture and uh, use u equals uh, negative one on the same picture, um, but I kind of did my own little code here, so. You can actually use that if you like. I call it phase switch. It's not by any chance optimal, but it does its job. So let me run that. Okay. So that's that's something you can play, and it's kind of nice to get get an idea. Um, and again, you can print the two things and just make it on a transparency and. You know, superpose the two if you'd like. Um, again, that's not your typical math, <laughs> working on a math problem type, uh, but it really is, that's what you do. Uh, so let's face switch here. Okay, so uh, let me not dwell too much into how I wrote this, it's not very, it's not very optimal. But what I did is I actually used the same. Well, one of the solvers of this differential equations or systems of differential equations that's behind that um, graphical interface. It's one of this Runge Kata. You might have heard of it. But uh, anyway, I'm not going to talk about the syntax here. Let me just run this. And also, it uses the. It, it, you have to input the, the system of the state system or the, the system of the state variables. And that's a function that I have here, and that's quite easy to put. That's, that's the same one, right? I mean, there's, a, there's some sp specific things you have to keep uh, in mind to, to use this uh, solver. But let's just run this and see what happens. OK, so I mark the initial point. I mark the terminal point. If and I don't have a legend, so I didn't put a legend. But, but this was with e equals 1, right? And I said, well, if it were to, um, work with e equals 1, I mean, it doesn't work with e equals 1, right? How about if I try e equals negative 1 initially? I get to the other equilibrium point, negative 1, 0. So it doesn't take me to the origin, right? So I just use a pause so I can do it one at a time. So now what's the next thing? Now, so this magenta, whatever the color is, um, indicates u equals 1, OK? And this is that backward solution starting at 0, 0. So this is the branch that I have to catch to get into the origin. And you already see the following thing, right? You see there is a intersection here, meaning that I, st I can start here with u equals negative 1. And after the time, which is very specific time, it takes from here t equals 0 to this point where these two curves intersect, I switch. And u equals 1 and drives me to the origin. And again, there is a specific time, because these are two very specific solutions. I mean, I try to actually write them down there, but right. So that's basically the t naught. Actually, I gave up. The t naught is if this is t equals zero, is how much time it takes to get to this point. Okay. Okay. And in this example, you can do it analytically. You can actually, I mean, you have the solution for. You have those solutions, right? With one plus e to the minus. 1 half t and so forth, and minus 1 plus, right? Um, it, it, it would just be sort of a computational exercise to, um, to find those values, numerical values, right? But we know, we know they exist. I mean, so the answer is, is this is the initial point. It goes. You go like this, as if you are going to 
towards that, that equilibrium, but then you switch and you catch this. You go like this, right? So the optimal solution is, and of course this is the optimal. So the optimal is negative one for for some for initial time, and then one. Again, to find t zero and t capital T. You just have to either numerically do it or, or piece of paper symbolically, right? And yeah, t0 is the time it takes to do that. Yes, t0 is the time it takes to, so this is correspond to t equals t0. This would be t equals 0, and this would be t equals capital T. Okay? So, now, you yes? You also get there by switching three or four times depending. You can also... How do you know the one where you switch <laughs> once is often? Okay. Um, so, since, since I don't plot the whole face portrait here, uh, you don't see, but, but uh, just right, you can actually switch many, many different times, kind of hop on curves of different colors if you use different colors. Um, how do you know that, that the minimum time is achieved by just this one switch? Okay. Um, well this gets into the question of sufficiency. So now that he that so what we have is is if you can hop on this curves, then that's a necessary condition, right? That's what the Pontryagin maximum principle is saying. Is saying if if I have a, an optimal solution, then this must happen, right? Now, uh, the other question is to actually get sufficient conditions for uh, optimality, okay? And those are not really. We don't talk about those. Um, but the result is, is says that minimizing the number of switches gives you the optimal. Okay. It's a general result. Yeah. Well, you have to have convexity and other things. So convexity will, will be one thing that guarantees the existence of a minimum, right? And then if you know there is a minimum, that that minimum uses the minimum number of switches. I mean, intuitively, you kind of, kind of see that. I mean, if you were to kind of go and, 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 and hop uh, several times from one face portrait to the other, um, the time would, would, to get from this point to this point would be bigger because you would be the sum of the times that you are from one to the other. But, I mean, that's just heuristically. It's not. Okay? So, um, I just wanted to kind of give you this so you have a feel. Um, and also, I wanted to kind of change these numbers. Um, let's, let's not take the initial point one, two, but let's take a bigger one. Five, eight. I don't know. Okay, if that's the case, I'm going to have to change this axis from negative 10 to 10, just just the window size. And let's try to run this and see what happens. Uh, this should clear actually. Okay, so let's run it again. I might have just been the lucky guy today. <laughs> well, I think it gets really close. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. so that's not a good choice. Um, let's see. All the spirals get really tight. Let's do eight and five. I don't know. Oh, that's right. But still, uh, I want to see what's. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, um, 
if I continue, and let's say this doesn't really go through the origin, but I can actually go, if I choose, if I choose the other one, then certainly I wouldn't go through the origin, right? So, now let's see the, the, the tail, kind of the, uh, the, yeah, the backward solution starting at zero, meaning that the, the, the path you would take the last, the last portion of your motion would be pretty close, right? Anyway, still different. No, this is this one that's, yeah. And um, the other one is, one more. What, what did I do? Hmm. Let me just run it. One, two, three. Something's happening here. Oh, I know what happens. I'm sorry. It's just going. Um, Okay, I may not be able to make it to work, and I don't want to spend too much time on this, but um, there are going to be initial conditions. I don't know, it's just kind of... Oh, okay, this is it. Um, there are going to be initial conditions where um, you might have to do more than one, one, one uh, switch. Hmm? Uh... Here's one switch also because you go this way and then you catch the other one. But you see, you start with one and you go to negative one. So the strategy really depends on where you start. It's not there's no formula which says that. <laughs> it's it's going on the magenta one. It's going like it will go to u equals. It goes with u equals one, and it catches here. Uh, the tail of this. Why would you start with negative one and go inside? It looks like it might take less time. Right at the beginning, start at the initial point. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, right. You're right. You're right. Yeah. So, no. If you start with negative one, you hit this. So you go to another. It doesn't hit this one. This is the back one. No, but well, it does eventually switch to positive one right there, and it hits that one. And you follow mm -hmm. positive. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, so this. Okay, so this is with. Thank you. So this is with two switches. Yeah. All right. So minimizing the number of switches really doesn't always. No, no. But this will be the minimum number of switches you you have to. There's nothing less than two. Right, right, right. So that's the optimal. Right. So you couldn't do the one. Yeah. Okay. Right. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, I should have used different colors, but. So it's more. It's clear. Actually, it's clear on my picture, but it's not clear on that screen. <laughs> Which one are they around? If you start with positive one. If you start here, you have two choices. If you go this way. You can just make the one switch. Oh, okay. That's the thing is you can do just one switch. But yeah. Dan is saying if you do two switches this time, it looks more optimal than just one switch. Does it? Uh, I'm sorry, it's hard to see on this picture. Let me let me look here, and I'll tell you. Okay. Yeah, the whole question is, how do you get from this point to this point? What's the what's the minimum? And uh, looks like negative one would be quicker point. We you don't know. I mean, not just by the lengths. I mean, the lengths are not. But you see, this this guy is actually farther apart from 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 the equilibrium. So this is slower. Here is going to be slower. I don't know. 
Anyway, so you can kind of see the complications if you, if you have different points. So um, let, me, uh, let me stop here. There's also a nice um, thing you can actually see. I made a link here, optimal control uh, applets. There are app applets here. Um, let's go on the uh, linear pendulum. So linear pendulum is, is just the um, x1 prime because x2, x2 prime is minus x1. So there's no friction. Okay. Um, so the the, the Uncontrolled, so with u equals zero, you would get circles, right? And the pendulum just gonna swing. That means the circle. This is periodic. If you kind of input a control negative one to one, look how nice of a picture you're gonna get. What are you trying to optimize? Time, minimum time, from to get from 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 a given point. So the pendulum has a certain initial configuration, like it's like this. Those that have kids know this, right? You uh, you kind of put the pendulum in a certain initial position, a certain initial velocity, right? And without control and no friction, it would just keep going. I mean, not around, but in the phase portrait, because this is the position of this velocity. It would go periodic, right? So the position would go you know, this way, and the velocity would be sometimes positive, sometimes negative. Um, but now that you, if you impose, the, if you have the control negative one to one, you know, you know this kind of uh, possibility between negative one to one, look what happens. You're going to have to, well, the optimal says use either one or negative one, okay? So now we're trying to stop that kid from from uh, swinging, right? I want to say, bring it to a, f you know, to a rest in minimum time. What are you going to do? Well, you have only this much force. You're going to apply that force, kind of opposed to the motion, right? But as you, as you already know, you don't, you, you're not going to have to be able to do that in one, one shot. You're going to have to do several shots. And turns out that look, uh, the first time you're going to kind of follow a circle that's centered at this point, right? So the, the face portrait is shifted. Is that concentric circles, but shifted negative one and one, okay? And the first time ends up uh, starting with something shifted, something that's centered around negative one. So you go kind of like this. There is a point here, there is some sort of theory behind this, but there is a point and that's not, that's not when the velocity is zero. So it's not when you, when the, the pendulum reached the, um, the extreme, the, the maximum height that you push, you change the, the, it's basically past that, a little bit past that to achieve an optimal result. And then you kind of shift to a, a circle that's centered here, right? And you go from here up the way to here, right? If you can look at this, this it's kind of hard to see because of the scale. But the blue ones are, are set, arcs of circles centered at negative one, and the green ones are arcs of circles centered. No, and the, also the blue ones <laughs> um, are arcs of circles centered at the positive one. Notice what happens. Once you reach this uh, last small circle that goes straight to the origin, it means after five switches, you've reached the uh, rest, zero, zero. Okay? So just a very simple uh, control problem with constraints leads to this complicated behavior. I mean, that's, okay? I mean, it's not complicated, but it's it's uh, depending on the initial condition can lead to many number, uh, uh, several number of switches. What are these other small little, you know, arcs, little half circles? I mean, it, it looks like 
looks like. So how that's telling you where to switch. Um, well, this, this, you mean those green ones? No, the little roundish ones. Oh, yeah, that's, that's the places where you have to switch. And there are, there are radius 1 centered at this. Um, okay. I mean, uh, think about setting up this problem. You're going to set up the Hamiltonian. You're going to set up the um, P, the equation the system in P. And the switch criteria will be where the coefficient of U and H goes from negative to positive or from positive to negative. You write that coefficient of U will be P2 or something, right? So by solving the system in P2, it's basically going to be sine or cosine. Okay? Solving that system in P2 uh, is going to say, you know, uh, when to switch. And the criteria ends up looking like, like this. When this circles, when the trajectory ends, hits one of these circles. Okay? Yeah, that's when the sign of P and the sign of the coefficient changes. Oh, well, it's hard. Yeah, I, I didn't write down the. Um, P. But that's that's sort of kind of. Um, Intercept miss missile. Uh, it's another one. It's kind of similar to the problem Homer problem there, but a little bit different. I didn't see a. An applet, but it just kind of gives you the setup, and it's saying you see a missile here that goes at a certain distance, um, and you have to pick the angle to kind of shoot that um, missile and to hit it in the minimum time or something like that. Okay, so you can read these things. This, these things are sort of for your enjoyment. Rocket car, it's, it's again something very standard. Um, it's basically x2 is x1 prime and u is x2 prime. So it's basically x double prime equals u. So use the force and x is the same thing, right? Um, and again, how can you bring an object that is at a certain location like 2 with velocity 1, so it's going in that direction, how can you bring in a minimum time to the origin? With this kind of constraints on the, on the control, and you know, you go through this, the answer is, again, it's a picture, but it's, um, in this case, it's easier because the um, face portrait for u equals 1 and u equals negative 1 are parabolas. So basically, this would be the parabola shifted. Okay, So that's, that's the same parabola, it's just shifted. And you can actually do this in, phase, in p plane 7. Um, and the other one is, is parabola shifted the other way. Okay? So solution by picture is you plot the initial point, and you see how you can catch one of these things that drives the system into the origin. <coughs> okay. Okay. So that's so that's again for your enjoyment. Um, any questions? Yes. Again, yeah. You said that time optimal problems solve the adjoint system with H of capital T basically equal to zero. Oh, okay, the, the last piece. And then I was wondering what exactly that meant. I was trying to apply that on these homework problems, but I wasn't sure. Okay. Um, the question is I don't know if I have it here to pull it up. Yeah. Um, so the question uh, refers to uh, the case of time optimal problems um, when you have, when among everything else, you also have to find the time it takes to reach that, um, I mean, 
for the optimal solution to reach the designated state, uh, final state, right? So that's given. You have the initial state given, the final state given. Uh, the adjoint system has no conditions, right? It's just like the, this problem, like problem number four. Um, this actually turns out to be part of the principle that is um, the adjoint system in the end has to have um, this natural boundary condition. Okay, so that's that's a natural boundary condition for P at capital T, uh, T at capital T, right? But it's not that useful, I mean, it's not always useful, because uh, it would actually have you, I mean, only if you're interested in finding what P is, okay? Remember in our problem four, we said, oh, P has this, you know, P2 has this spiraling out, so it's changing sign, right? But let's move on, and let's say, let's look at the face portraits, right? And the moment we can find basically where it switches, you know, we can match the two, we're done, okay? So sort of as implicitly this, this relation is going to be satisfied if you have to find P, right? But nobody wants to find P unless you're forced to find P, right? In other examples, like in other homework uh, pro exercise, what was that number? Number 10, which I don't know if the 440, 442 students looked at, but um, it was sort of an interesting problem. It's like that, uh, almost like that missile, um, no, similar to that. Um, And I have the picture here. Basically, what you do is you start at initial condition, in, initial uh, x equals zero and velocity zero. So notice how sometimes it's more, uh, uh, you know, uh, useful to plot x versus t. Other times is better to plot x versus x prime, and so forth. I mean, in fact, you can. Uh, all of them should be plotted, but I mean the relevant information is is in uh, in this case is in this picture, where you st at time zero, the two spacecrafts are at locations A and B, right? Then look, uh, B is kind of moving at cer at a s constant speed, right? So I don't understand why fighter pilots don't are not required to, to learn uh, optimal control problems. Um, which they, they don't, right? Some. OK. Uh, because if B were like not a constant speed, which usually is not, right? You're trying to chase something, and it's not a constant speed unless it's the uh, International Space Station. Um, and it would be an even more interesting problem, right? But here is just constant speed, right? It's going at a constant speed. You're trying to catch it, um, moving away from you, and you 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 know have no velocity initially, right? So in fact, what's going to happen at a very initial time? The distance is going to be increased. I mean, because you have speed zero, and and the guy you're chasing has already some some positive speed. So it's going to the velocity the distance between the two is going to increase a little bit, but then you have to pick up fast, right? But you can go really fast because you have to to reach it at a certain uh, determined speed. So so it has to kind of have an inflection point there, right? So you have to have a positive second derivative that is u. Yeah? Cuz x prime x double prime is u. So u has to be positive, it has to be going fast, and then it has to go be, be negative, okay? And that's what turns out to be actually if I plotted it at the bottom of the next page. Um, now, there was a question of that, well, what is that T 
has to be less than a certain T1. What is that? Uh, where is that constraint in, in, to, in enters the picture? Um, well, that simply says you know, you shouldn't just wait. I mean, you should be quite relatively fast, right? You have a constraint on how, how slow you can be initially. So you have to be relatively fast. But you can be really fast because then the integral of u squared is not going to be minimized, right? So you're trying to minimize that energy, whatever, used in integral of u squared. But still, don't, you're not allowed to be too slow because you're not going to catch in that fixed time interval of time, right? So one strategy which I think, I don't know, many, maybe other, anybody thought about any of this inequality constraint? No, OK. Um, one strategy would say just you know, ignore that for now. Fix a t and do it for that fixed t. And at the very end, just say, well, whatever minimum integral of u square I got for that fixed t, now let's minimize that with respect to t between 0 and t1. And ends up uh, looking like you have to maximize the t, capital T to be t1, the maximum possible. So you have to, you want to go as slow as you're allowed to, to still catch that in that time interval because that, that's, that's going to give you the integral of u squared to be minimum. And it all comes from, uh, from this, um, <clears throat> you know, it's just a quadratic. I mean, u star is linear. So in this case, it's good that you solve the p system, right? And it's an easy system to solve. Um, you don't have constraints on u, so that, that's these are the two things that are very important. You, when you when you look at a control problem, you say, well, do I have any kind of restrictions on u? In this case, you don't, right? So how do you minimize? Set the Hamiltonian derivative of Hamiltonian h with respect to u equals zero, right? What if you had some constraints? What if you have some additional constraints on u? Say, I cannot go faster than then what would you need to do? Which is something in the final, by the way. So you've got you to know the answer. You still minimize the Hamiltonian, which is quadratic, but with on whatever interval you're allowed to take u. So it may be that the minimum is achieved inside, in which case this derivative of h with respect to u is zero, or at one of the endpoints. Right? So if, if, and that's the other thing I, I've, I mean, you already know, for, uh, those of you that ask, but uh, if h uh, turns out to be linear in u, there's no derivative that you said to be equal to zero. So. The, the very first time you see the, the control problem, you know what? You see, is there a new square in that problem? Or is only u? You know, and that's going to automatically tell you the Hamiltonian is, how is, how is Hamiltonian going to look? OK? All right. Um, OK. Let's see. Finally, problem number 12. I skipped first problem, so well, I'll skip the first problem altogether because I think that's done quite ex uh, you know extensively here. Um, I mean, what's what's the most difficult thing in this in this? Uh, let's say you don't have uh, constraints on you. And what's the most difficult? Solving the p system, right? And then uh, when you write u as a function of whatever it is in terms of p, um, is that u has to go back into the equation for x. And then you have to sol excuse me, also solve this system in x, right? 
and take into account all those like initial conditions, boundary conditions, so forth, terminal conditions. Um, okay. So I'll let you look at the uh, solution to problem number two if you have questions. Um, and number 12, for number 12, there was an integral constraint for u. Okay? That's kind of unusual if you think about it, because when you have a control, I mean, the physicists will know this. When you have a control on a system, you normally have you know, um, instantaneous I mean, the control is sort of, for each t, there is a control that you, you impose, and that has some bounds, right? So it's natural to have u between negative 1 and 1 or something. It's less natural to say that, well, the total something with respect to control has to be a certain number or has to be at most something. But nevertheless, I mean, you can have that. If u is the rate at which you're pouring milk and coffee, then the integral of u is the total amount of milk you have uh, at your disposal. And so setting that to be equal to something, it's, you know, uh, it's just natural. How do you deal with those when you have control problems with in integral con constraints on the optimal control? See, now you have to be able, like, to, uh, after this course is over, you should be able to say, oh, I haven't seen this example, but I can do it. <laughs> uh, I, I've never seen, a, you know, worked out an integral of, you know, an integral constraint on, a, on an optimal control problem. But how do you actually do it? It's really like a Lagrange multiplier problem, right? Of course, in that infinite dimensional space. But in the end, it's basically you augment the Hamiltonian with lambda times the integrand that appears in your in your constraint. So it's just lambda u. That's where the lambda u comes from. And then the rest is the same, except you have one more painful variable there to keep in mind. Unknown, right? Unknown, lambda is a fixed unknown that you may or may not have to find, right? But you know it has to exist. Um, Honestly, I think when I first looked at it, it says, let's just ignore the constraint. Has anybody tried that, ignore the constraint? Yeah, but that's a problem. Right. So you don't get the same thing. You don't get the same, I mean, of course, you don't know if it's right or wrong, but whatever you get. But um, there, is, there, is a, there is a reason why, why this is, I mean, just think about this for a second. So I have um, minimize, what is that? the time, yeah, so 1 dt. Subject to, besides everything else, subject to this, integral of u dt equals 1, right? Okay? And everything else. And okay? And we even have x of x naught, right? And we even have what we want x of t to look like, right? We want that to be whatever, right? So what do you, how do you deal with that? Well, it's just It would be the same to say replace u, replace one with one plus u, right? 
subject to the same constraints. Why? Because that integral is the integral of 1 plus the integral of u. And the integral of u is fixed. Minimizing that or minimizing that is the same thing. Subject to the same constraint is the same. But I'm saying, if you see this problem or you see the problem 1 plus u subject to that and that is the same thing, right? Because you're still minimizing this plus the integral of the integral of 1 plus the integral of u, which we are restricted to be a certain fixed number, right? Same 1 plus 2u, right? See, so that's, that's why you cannot ignore this when you set up the Hamiltonian. It's not, f is not just that. It's, it's basically that plus a constant times u. So that's where this for any fixed constant. This, this minimizing this is the same as minimizing that. Subject to the, all the other constraints. Kept the same. Okay? So basically that's why the Hamiltonian has to have 1 plus you know lambda u plus p times f. Okay? Alright. And that, that reminds me is exactly the same as Lagrange multiplier for equality con integral constraint and variational problems. So it's the same thing. Okay. And that uh, well that just leads to um, having to carry along that lambda with you. Um, I'll just ask you to follow this so I don't write it any, anymore. Um, it's, the Hamilton is still, is still linear in U, okay? It would have been a different story if, for instance, the integral, would, uh, the integral constraint would have been U squared equals 1, right? Then Hamilton wouldn't have been uh, linear, but still with the constraints u between 0 and 1, so you would have the possibility of achieving the minimum between 0 and 1. Okay? By the way, this kind of um, control problems where the control takes one of the extremes is called bang-bang control, if you've heard the term. Um, so if, if, it's not, if it's not, if it's quadratic, constraint is quadratic or something, then you may not, you may have some sort of you know, extreme, then something in between, then extreme, something in between, extreme, and so forth, right? But if it's linear, you always have, like, jump, right? Piecewise, like, constant. And my best example is, when you drive your car, if you like driving your car, I mean, I know you like driving your car. <laughs> well, no, because it's in repair, he said. Okay. Anyway, when it's working. Um, Take a nice scenic route, and when you take when you take turns, just watch your, your of course, watch the road. But uh, <laughs> look at your how you steer. You'll notice that you actually don't steer continuously. You steer in jumps. Just do this when you go home today. I mean, how do you, you basically steer a little bit, and then you see, you know, in a few seconds, do I have to do more or less or less? You never do it continuously because it just takes too much of your brain energy to do it continuously. So you kind of minimize that, you know, subconscious. Um, it's, it's an interesting um, psychological <laughs> discovery. But anyway, that's a Pontragian principle right there, bang, bang, control. Um, Okay, what, do I want to say something else about this? Yes, I want to say something else. Um, U is in this case uh, Hamilton is linear. U is either zero or one. Who tells you whether it's zero or one? This kind of complicated coefficient of U, right? Okay. What do you notice there? There's not just p, there's also x in the, in the thing. So x changes with time, p changes with time, 
Lambda is some unknown thing. How on earth can we figure out where the, where the switch is going to happen? Okay? And that's why the problem was a little bit more specific. It said, show that you have to start with a zero and then switch to one. That is, pour no milk, let it cool the coffee by itself, and then pour the milk at a constant rate until it gets to the desired temperature. Okay? My wife still doesn't get it. I said, like, what do you mean? <laughs> yeah, that's one issue. But the other issue is, like, why don't we just pour like everything like really fast? You know, here it has like a bound. You cannot pour more than a certain rate, right? So you have like a really tiny bottle, something like that. Okay. Um, okay. So um, again, it's one of those other things. It's like how do you, you know, proceed and. Um, there is no recipe. I mean, the thing is, you just um, kind of use a p-plane. That would be a good use of p-plane, plotting x versus p. Okay. Um, the bottom line is that you know, since we know the answer, the answer is what you have to switch. You you can only switch once, and you switch from negative to positive, right? So how can you show that? And um, I mean, there is a computation which shows that this expression, however complicated it looks, the derivative of that expression is always has the same sign. So it's either always increasing or always decreasing, right? So that's basically saying you can always switch at most one time, right? With respect to time. You can always switch one time. If it's an increasing function or decreasing, right? You basically have, it either stays always positive, stays always negative, or goes once from positive to negative or from negative to positive. And basically those four cases, um, okay, the last page should have a one there. Okay, I just consider the two cases, and you can see why. The case when you always stay with one, or, yeah, or always stays with zero, it's sort of um, you can rule those out really quick. Why? Well, you go back to the system and say, well, u equals zero. Okay, you don't put any 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 milk in it. <laughs> What's going to happen with the system? X prime equals minus x. You always look at the state system, right? X prime equals minus x. And you should know how to solve that. That's e to the minus t, right? That never gets to zero. So that's why zero was chosen, really. So that's, you rule that out. U um, equals one all the time. Well, you cannot keep one all the time because you have a finite amount of u. The integral of u has to be one, right? So you can at most do that up to time equal one, and that's case one, basically. And why, do you, why is the case one ruled out also? You start with u equals 1, and even if you stay with the interval 0 to 1, so u equals 1 constant, watch what x does. x drops, but doesn't drop to 0. And then you're left out of milk, so then the rest has to kind of cool down by itself, and that will never get to 0. So you do want it to drive to zero in finite time. That's basically why you rule this first case, too. And then it's just the second case. And then the second point is, once you know the strategy, you, you just don't know when the switch is happening, and you don't know how long it's going to take. How do you do that? You just basically say, make the um, match between those two curves, you know, the two, the two solutions. Um, and you get T0 and you get capital T. I mean, I, I ended up with capital T 1.6970. And I didn't compute what T naught. Uh, well, no, no. T naught is, we know what it is. It's a minute before or an hour or whatever. A second before the end of the time because that's how much integral of u still has to be equal to 1. So that should be 0 0.6970. T has to be and t has to be greater than 1. And it ends up being greater than 1. 
So okay, so that's that's uh, that's that. Let's. Um, I want to take a break. I want to um, actually before the break, I want to give you this.